G'day there guys, it's your Aussie hubby Marky, back at it again with another r slash legal advice video. Now if you love me as much as I love you, then you know what to do. I want you to mosey on over to that old like button and tackle it like Steve Irwin would tackle a bloody crocodile. Maybe even chuck an Aussie flag down in the comments. Now with that said, I want you to sit back, relax, chuck a prawn on the barbie, and get ready for some bloody good legal advice. Now our first post is by user Pally Howe, titled, Mechanic said it would take two weeks to fix my car. It's been three months, and now he says he wants more than what we agreed on, or he'll transfer the title over to him. I live in Washington State. My car broke down in April, and I couldn't afford to take it to the shop. Luckily, the AAA tow truck driver said that he had experience rebuilding my specific car, and could do it for way cheaper, 400 bucks. I paid him 100 bucks at the start, then another 100 bucks after three weeks. Every time I asked how close it was, he would never give me a definite answer. Something always came up. Just last night, he said he finally got it done. But now he wants 300 bucks instead of the 200 bucks, and he said he will transfer the title over to him if I don't pay him that amount. Is he even able to do that? I feel like I shouldn't have to pay more seeing that he had my car for so long. Thanks. Rule of thumb, never pay upfront for services that aren't rendered. Also, if you have the threat in writing to sign over your property without your consent of you, don't pay blackmail money, call the cops. Should I text him saying I'll be getting the cops involved to see if he'll give it up? Or should I just go ahead and call? You don't have proof yet. If it's not in writing, the cops will probably dismiss it as a civil matter. If you get them to admit in writing they are extorting you, you have a better case for the cops arresting him and getting your property back without having to pay the mechanic for not doing their job or going to court for it. Does text count? Everything he said is over text. Print out the texts and go to the cops and tell them the person is extorting you and holding your property ransom. He can't just transfer the title, that's bullcrap. And another one asks, have you even seen your car at this point? Do you know firsthand that it's fixed, together, runs, etc? I just went to go check it out. Car started up, but it had the same problem as it did before I gave it to him. He said the only problem it had was a snapped timing belt and a bad head. He fixed both those things, but the main problem wasn't fixed whatsoever, and was even worse than before. He said it wasn't his fault because he couldn't hear that issue before, and now wants me to pay him $300 and deliver him an entire new engine that he would put in for free. Yeah, I'm gonna call BS on that offer. It's extremely difficult and expensive as all hell, depending on the engine type and everything to get a new engine, even if it's salvaged. This guy is clearly ripping you off and you need to get AAA and the police involved. Also, since you said the car is now worse than it was, it's likely he caused his own damage to the engine. I don't know what all laws deliberate engine damage would fall under, but that's where the cops come in and hopefully put this scam to rest. He just texted me again saying, the car isn't leaving my property until you pay me $300 or you can sign the title over to me. This guy isn't running a mechanics business. It's your car. Call the cops, tell them that this guy was supposed to fix your car, didn't, and you tried to get your car and he stopped you. Since it's your name on the title, they should go with you so you can get it. And let the tow truck driver pound sand. He can sue you in small claims court if he wants the 300 bucks. Also, like everyone else said, inform AAA about this. And they updated the post. Went to go check out the car. Waited 30 minutes for him to put the intake and oil in, which he said he had already did the night before. He started the car and it just blew a ton of burning oil smoke and made an even worse clicking noise than it did before I even brought it to him. His excuse was that he didn't hear that before, so he didn't know it was a problem. He then said he would replace the engine for free as long as I gave him the 300 bucks and bought him a new engine. I talked with the cops as well and he said there wasn't much I could do since he hasn't actually stolen it yet. Update 2, ended up paying him $160 and towed the car out. Also called AAA and reported it with them. Thanks everyone for the advice. Alright, and our next post is by user Stabbed and Fired. Titled, Texas. Disgruntled ex-employee came back to work a week ago and stabbed me. I am being fired because of it. I just now got out of the hospital. Last Monday on the 28th, I had an old employee we let go on Friday come in. 
Now, this is not unusual, as people generally forget things when they leave. I asked him what he was doing here. He said he needed to talk to me about what happened. This guy was let go for budget reasons. Simple as that. We cut five employees, and he unfortunately made the cut. I informed him that there was no real reason why he was let go. Just a business decision, and that we would have glowing letters of recommendation for him, will not interfere with unemployment, and will actually give good references for everyone who called. This point he claims it's bullcrap and gets hostile. I try to calm him down, as does many other co-workers nearby. His friend tried to say he would take him to lunch and pay. Basically, everyone knew he needed to leave at this point. He seemed to calm down, but then he pulled out a pocket knife and stabbed me in the stomach. I did not even realize I had been stabbed yet, as I saw the knife and reacted. I grabbed his arm and held it firmly. The adrenaline was rushing through me so much I did not realize that I had been stabbed yet until I saw the blood. I started to panic and punched him with my free hand in the jaw a few times. I guess one of them hit home as he dropped to the ground. I sat down in on the ground, holding the knife in me as I knew it was probably the only thing keeping me from bleeding out. The other workers that were there held him down until the police arrived. The ambulance took me and I went in for surgery. Today I receive a phone call that I do not have to return to work. I told my boss that I would be ready for light duty on Monday. He said my health was not what he meant. One of the HR guys saw me punch the fired worker a few times and said that my face was like a vicious animal. Exact words. I told my boss that this was to be expected when fight or flight kicks in. He agreed with me and said that he wished we did not have to do this, but that everyone who got physical with a former employee will probably be let go pending a review by legal. This will make me lose my insurance. I am worried about continuing medical issues. The stab wound is still infected, but I have been given both pills and a cream for this. I'm mainly worried about losing the job. Is there any kind of suit I can bring up if I am fired for this? I know you can sue someone for anything you want. I am asking about suits that would have a reasonable chance of winning given a good lawyer. Also, is it legal for my job to fire me and the guy who helped me over this? The guy was only out for maybe a half a minute, so he was still a danger. It took the police 12 minutes to show up. Hello, the ambulance was forced to wait outside for five minutes until the police showed up to secure the situation. This guy had plenty of time to harm other people. How can a job just up and fire everyone like this? I'm guessing yes because Texas, but is this even legal? This is a run, don't walk, assuming your stitches allow for it, to the nearest employment attorney type situation. You have a legal and natural right of self-defense. They fired you for protecting yourself in a situation where you had a legal right to do so. This isn't a deal where you had a gun against policy or whatever. You used your hands. This is almost certainly a wrongful termination. You should do fine in the lawsuit. Unless there are factors that we're not privy to, such as you having let him in against policy or something like that. And even then. This was a very stupid move on the part of the employer. Hell, your lawyer might be able to get the NRA to pay you for your litigation costs because of the self-defense aspect. Good luck. This is fudging amazing. You got canned because you looked violent whilst defending yourself from a guy who was trying to murder you? Employment lawyer, for the love of God. Don't go to some small shop, neither. Go to a firm that specializes in employment. They'll know how to properly monetize this. What a terrible thing to happen. I hope you heal up quick. Yeah, I'd love to meet the HR person who thought getting stabbed in the stomach is nothing to warrant a violent face while fighting a potential murder. This had nothing to do with HR and everything to do with the legal slash liability department. They probably have very strict and no tolerance violence policies like schools do now. Like his boss said, everyone who got physical is likely getting fired. In their eyes, that's the easiest way to avoid any and all liability. How ironic that it might end up costing them a crap load of money if it's lawsuit worthy. What exactly is the liability that they are avoiding? The guy who stabbed OP successfully suing the company? Yes. An employee of their company got physical with a former employee on the company's property during his shift. It's bullcrap, but it's the same idea behind being civilly liable for shooting someone who was breaking into your house with the intent to harm. And last one, 
Do not, I say again, do not sign any termination paperwork with your former employer if they request it, and avoid any communication with HR, no matter how shady they act, without seeking legal counsel first. Do not sign anything, but do not request it in writing. Call your old boss back and tell him you need your termination in writing for your food stamp application. Just get him to send it and don't tell him what for, but don't make any threats. I am not a lawyer, I don't believe it would be illegal no matter what you said to him, but please correct me. And ask him if he can email that to you because you won't be coming back to the building. Get this in writing and you should have what they call a slam dunk. Heck, this is in Texas. Record asking the boss about the reason again and whether a job reference will say the same thing, or something similar that highlights the absurdity, then ask for it in writing. The recording will be more valuable. And now, update stabbed at work and fired for my troubles. So before I give you the update, I wanted to say a few things. First, I am not some jujitsu Muay Thai, Taekwondo, Krav Maga, Patrick Swayze Roadhouse style bar bouncer. I know it's Krav Maga, not Krav Maga, okay? I am not a veteran who obtained my sick martial arts skills in the streets of Mosul. What happened was simply adrenaline and a decent amount of martial arts training I received when I was kid kicking in. Although I do occasionally work out at the gym at my work, so I am stronger than your average network admin. Also, for those calling bullcrap in the PMs saying that a punch to the jaw will not knock you out, well, I have a small lesson. A well-placed punch to the jaw can cause minor to major brain trauma, as the act of your brain shaking about in your head can overload the nervous system, making you lose consciousness. Your muscles instantly relax and you fall to the ground with no memory of the last few seconds. In other words, go watch some UFC. Second, to the people in the thread and in my PMs, I did not punch him in retaliation for stabbing me. His knife was still inside me and his hand was on the knife when I punched him, in pure fear. More like 100% pure terror. So on to the update. The company I worked for is a wholly owned subsidiary. This will be important later. The CEO of my company was unwilling to hear my side of it, no matter how many times I tried to approach him. The best response I got was when his secretary gave me the line of, trusting the decisions of HR. Several emails and two phone calls got this same response from him and his assistant each and every time. Because of the fact that no one at the office is willing to even hear my side, I decided to go to a lawyer that was recommended through a friend. Friend contacted a lawyer he used in the past who referred me to someone he trusts. Upon hearing my story, the lawyer was very eager to take my case on contingency. As an added bonus, he decided to represent the other three guys who helped out that day as well. The lawyer decided to name the parent company in the suit alongside our former employer. His reasoning is that the parent company would have reviewed all corporate policies that the subsidiary has, and that they would have had final say on the policies and procedure. This would have inevitably included the zero tolerance workplace violence clause that caused us to be terminated. Well, the parent company, a company with many public contracts for city and state police in the area, might I add, was not too happy to hear about what had happened. The event was apparently downplayed when it was reported to the parent company. They told the parent company something along the lines of, a scuffle broke out in the office, as a result, one of the employees was seriously injured. All employees involved will be terminated, and law enforcement are handling the criminal aspect. Paraphrasing, but that was the gist of it. Upon hearing about the truth of the matter, they were very quick to set up a meeting with us. This is a company that is in the self-defense and security business, not to be confused with people in the firearm business. They do not sell firearms, but do provide armor, non-lethal options, and have security subsidiaries for police, security firms, and private citizens. Given the nature of their business, they know full well the damage that negative press could do if word got out that one of their subsidiaries fired a guy who fought for his life. This was the PR nightmare that gave us the edge in the negotiations. The subsidiary I worked for is not in the self-defense business. They are a security monitoring firm that only handles corporate contracts, so they were not worried about the kind of press like the parent company was. Upon hearing the full details of what went down that day, the parent company went into panic mode. The three guys who helped down my attacker won't be getting their old jobs back, but they were offered jobs doing the same thing at a parent company's facility, 12 miles away. 
They will also be compensated for lost wages at time and a half their normal pay rate for the time that they were out of work. Parent company pretty much directed our old company to comply with this offer, and our old company cut them a check. Since parent company has better benefits and better pay, this was a slam dunk victory for those three. Cherry on top for them is that it means a closer drive for all of them. This offer was contingent on the three guys not going after either company for monetary compensation outside of what was offered and the signing of a non-disclosure agreement, with the NDA and a signed contract guaranteeing employment for at least a year, barring obvious reasons to fire people. It would have been stupid of them not to take it. For me, it was a little more complicated. They are very willing to offer me the same thing, but there are complications from infections that occurred from the stabbing as I developed MRSA in the wound. Fortunately, it remains localized in my wound and does not spread to my bloodstream. However, if it progresses any worse than it currently is, my doctor thinks it may be prudent to cut out the infection. It is being watched very carefully, and I spend probably two days out of the week in the hospital having the wound drained. In the meantime, I have been offered the job, plus the ability to be paid while I work from home. This would allow me to be on their excellent coverage plan. They only have a 1k deductible for a single person. My lawyer basically told me that this was the best possible deal that I could get without going to trial. He explained that the parent company can take the hit on the publicity and survive, but since all they have to do is offer me a job and get the old company to pay me for the time I was out of work, why not? Minor expense to them, and they do not have to worry about bad publicity. I took the deal they offered and signed a non-disclosure agreement. So TLDR of that one is that each of us were offered compensation for lost wages and offered better paying jobs at the parent company. Far as I know, our former employer is paying the lawyer fees. We did not pay a dime for his services. As for the guy who stabbed me, I was very ticked off to learn that he was offered a plea deal. His charges were reduced from attempted murder to aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Since he was a model citizen before his knife wielding episode, and since this was a crime of passion, he was offered a mere one year in prison and a year of probation, plus a 10k fine. I am told that there is a possibility that he can have his record expunged, and that he can be out in as little as six months. I know that he has not appeared before the judge yet to take this plea deal. They were waiting to see if I would die as the charge would obviously change from aggravated assault to murder of the second degree. Once they found out that I was stable and that the MRSA was not life-threatening, they set a court date for the 12th. I will be there. Because of the fact that a lawsuit against him right now would be a lawsuit against his wife and child, I decided not to do anything on that front. Going after him would be a cash grab and would only hurt two people who had nothing to do with what happened that day. So I see no reason to sue him. Also, before it is asked, yes, I am taking extreme measures to deal with my MRSA. I have paid a company to come in and clean my house four times so far. I am taking my medications on time every time, and I am following a doctor's instructions for cleaning and replacing bandages. It is getting better, but my doctor thinks I will be dealing with this all the way until after Valentine's Day. Hell, that sucks, but I'm glad that everything is going better, and I hope OP didn't die of the MRSA. Anyway, on to our last post by Beauregard Precious, titled, Find $13,066 from the TSA for grabbing my insulin pump. Edited to add location, incident happened in Austin, Texas. I live in Florida. So I travel a lot for work, and I am a type 1 diabetic who uses an insulin pump. The pump manufacturer told me when I received my new pump that I cannot go through any x-ray machine, full body scanner, etc. When I go through the TSA line, I hold my pump out and tell them it cannot go through. Every time before this particular incident, they understood the protocol when I give them my spiel, take my pump, let me pass through the full body scanner, have my carry-on x-rayed, then as soon as I step through the full body scanner, they swab my pump, hand it back to me, and I go on my way. This time it was different. I did my usual spiel, held my pump out, and the TSA agent seemed flabbergasted. She grabbed a plastic bowl, put my pump in it, and set it aside. Told me to walk through the scanner, which I did with no problem. She told me to wait for another TSA agent to come and swab the pump. No problem here. Unusual from what I was used to, but I'm okay with it. Just some context. My blood sugar was high, and I needed that pump attached to me to take extra insulin to bring my blood sugar down. 
I didn't take any extra before going through the line, as I thought I'd get it right back, as I always do, after they swab it of course. A couple minutes go by, and this TSA agent keeps going about her business, waving people through the line with me still standing there, and her not acknowledging me. I walk over, tap her on the shoulder and say, hey, can you please address my pump, as I need it back. She says yes, but I will need to call another agent over to swab it, and radios for another TSA agent to come over to address. I wait another couple of minutes. Felt like an eternity, and I am starting to feel like crap from the high blood sugar coupled with the anxiety from being ignored. I tap her on the shoulder again, express the urgency, and she again, she says sure, and radios another TSA agent over to swab the pump. Another couple minutes go by, and no other TSA agent is responding, and she is going on her merry way scanning other people through the machine. Here is where I screwed up. I was so paranoid and out of it from my high blood sugar and lack of insulin that I grabbed the pump out of the bowl, attached it to my body, and went to my gate. About 45 minutes later, three TSA agents came to my gate, took me back to the scanning area, and interrogated me. I was fully cooperative, apologetic, explained the medical condition, etc. After I explained everything, they were very nice and apologetic to me too, but they said they had to fill out an incident report photograph my license, the pump, me, etc. Said I would be getting a letter in the mail, probably a warning and not to stress about it. Fast forward a week later and I get an official letter from the TSA in the mail saying I need to provide my side of the story, stating that I was in violation of Title 49 Code of Federal Regulations CFR 1540 blah blah blah, which is subject to a fine of up to $13,066 per violation. The letter does not provide the actual language of the above regulation, nor an assertion of how I violated the regulation. They stated I have 20 days to provide my defense, in writing, with any information that I wish to be considered in their investigation. A few questions. Should I consult an attorney and have them help me draft my response? 2. If not, how should I word my response? I can't refute leaving the TSA area with my pump which I admit was stupid, it was caught on camera. 3. Will my medical issues provide them with enough mitigating circumstances to drop the case against me? I'm thinking right now about explaining why I acted the way I did, and ignoring the fact I walked away like an idiot. Thanks in advance for any help. $13,000 is a crap load of money. Will I face jail time if I cannot pay? I was an idiot, but felt under duress due to my medical condition and the TSA negligently withholding my medication. 1. Yes, you should have an attorney assist in this. 2. Use assistance of one. Make sure to inquire if having a statement from your PCP or pump manufacturer would assist your case. 3. I am not a doctor. Would consequences of high blood sugar possibly be a mitigating factor in your decision making process? Thanks for the response. 1, 10, 4. I will be getting right on that. Thank you. 2. I have the manual from the pump manufacturer, which states this and will provide to number 1. 3. Absolutely without a doubt. Is just stating this sufficient, or do I need to provide proof? The proof is pretty much the experience of people that have this disease. I am guessing an attorney can help me with documenting this legally? I think a statement from your endocrinologist or PCP would be more useful than a letter of the manufacturer in this case. The manufacturer developed this device because it was easier for diabetics in general to take a dose of insulin than injecting with a hypodermic needle every time. Your doctor, on the other hand, is experienced with you and your disease history. My patient reports having a blood sugar level of X prior to entering the security line. He needed to take a dose of insulin within Y minutes. Waiting for a dollar sign time you were required to wait could have resulted in dollar sign condition A, condition B, and condition C. In addition to having your attorney refute the charges, I would suggest demanding an apology for both the ridiculous amount of time you were asked to wait for and for the danger that they put you in. They could have returned your pump and required you to continue to wait. Your pump could have been removed again for swabbing when an agent became available. They were very cavalier about what was rapidly escalating toward an emergency. Would they have kept a person with a prosthetic leg hopping around on the other for all that time? Agree with your first point, however. With the 20-day window, I received the letter on Friday, so now I guess it's an 18-day window. 
I seriously doubt I can get anything from my endocrinologist in time to send. Lots of red tape in his office, and it's a PITA to get him to respond to anything. To your second point, thank you. I was thinking this to myself, but did not want to seem unreasonable, so I never brought it up in my OP. I absolutely think I am owed an apology, or at least should go that route in my response. At the very least, have my attorney turn the tables on them a bit. Very good analogy with the prosthetic leg example. Thanks again. And now, update. Find $13,066 from the TSA for grabbing my insulin pump. First, I'd like to thank you all for the advice and supportive messages you have all sent me since I made this post. I reached out to a lawyer who drafted me a response free of charge to send back to the TSA. I questioned his verbiage as it looked to me like I was apologizing for everything and admitting guilt. He responded saying that yes, you are apologizing and asking for a warning instead of a fine, but nowhere in the email are you admitting guilt. He further stated that this is the best course of action for now and that he was 99% sure they would just drop it and just give me a warning. But should they come back with an actual fine to contact him back for official representation? I received the response today and they gave me a warning. No fine. I am so incredibly relieved. I know a lot of you encourage me to sue the TSA and whatnot, but I am overjoyed that this is finally behind me. I did have some definite fault in what transpired, and I won't make that mistake again. I do think that there was some significant negligence on the TSA's part that I could have taken some action on, but frankly, I'm glad it didn't come to that. Thank you all again for everything. Alright guys, that's where I'm going to wrap up the episode today. Tell me what you thought about these r slash legal advice stories. Anything at all down in the comments is appreciated. I love your faces. I hope you're having a good day, night, sleep, whatever you're up to. And I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.